All right, so here is the index HTML file from previous lesson. Um, we're going to modify this slightly um, to demonstrate how we can run JavaScript in the web client. So this is client side JavaScript. Um, and we'll talk more about like the client versus the server after break. Um, but this is going to be JavaScript that's going to run inside of Chrome on the computer, like the user's computer, not on any web server anywhere. Um, and this is really useful. There's times in order to make our web pages um, dynamic, uh, we need to be able to run code in the client. After break, we're going to focus more on what code is appropriate to run in the client and what code needs to run in the server and why that is. But today we're just going to see how can we run code period in the client and what does that, that look like. Um, so we're going to add an additional line of code um, to our index.html file. So I'm going to add this after the div for the button, but before we say we're done with the body, I'm going to add another element. And it's the script element, and it has an attribute, which is the source of the JavaScript file. And so in the double quotes, I specify a partial path um, to the file. And the file I'm going to reference is this file here, main.js, and it's inside of the scripts folder. So I'm going to type scripts slash main.js. And there's my closing tag. Okay. So when Chrome or any web browser web client loads this web page when it gets to this part of the web page it's going to load and execute the main.js file okay so simply by loading the web page this javascript is going to run as part of the page being loaded so let's add some code there to do some useful stuff There's nothing in here yet, but we're going to add, add a few different things. Um, we, folk, we spent several days at the beginning of this unit focused on like JavaScript and the basic elements and syntax and stuff. What we're focused on today is really how can we write code in JavaScript that interacts with HTML elements. Okay? That's how we're going to make our pages dynamic. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of different methods. Um, and, and in terms of how this, this works. So there is so much that can be done here. We're really limiting the scope to the most common use of JavaScript in a web client to develop Node.js web applications. Okay? So there are many different ways to do certain things. I'm showing you like, in my opinion, which is just my opinion, but um, what I think is like the best practices for doing these different things. As you look at other web applications, you're certainly going to see things done in other ways. I'm just trying to show you a way that I think is reasonable from like clean, cleanliness of code, performance, security, um, and also accessible to all of you who is learning all this web app framework stuff in the course of like four weeks. So first, first method, uh, JavaScript method I want to share with you is the query selector method and the query selector method returns the first element in the document that matches the specified selector and for example a specified selector could be like h1 for that first level heading so here's an example let's say we want to actually find the um, element our, for our h1 element. So switching back to index HTML, we have this h1 element right here that says Mozilla is cool. So we want to find, we want to get a reference to this element in our document. This whole file, index.html, is our document. So we can say something like const my heading equals 
document um, is already defined. Okay, so document is a variable we can reference. It refers to the current HTML document that this script is running inside of. Um, almost like a this type behavior, right? Like it's this document. So we use the word document for that. The method is query selector. And we pass in the selector, which in our case is going to be h1. Now we have a reference to the element in the web page. Okay. Um, so we so we can actually change the element. Um, so JavaScript script can modify an attribute of an HTML element. So for example, we can say my heading dot text content equals hello world. Yeah, question. Um, well, we can only want load one HTML file at a time, right? So because our index.html file here this is our document, this whole thing. Um, and because this index.html file is what loads our script, document will be automatically defined by the JavaScript engine running in the web browser um, to refer to this document here. Yeah, if we were to go to a different page, document would refer to a different document. Yep, excellent question. Um, let's actually load this thing. Get the window so you all can see it. So notice at the top now, it says hello world and not Mozilla is cool, right? Our script changed the document when the script was executed, despite what's in the HTML file. This particular example, not super useful, right? Like if we wanted to say hello world, we should just make the HTML say hello world. But there's many other cases where we're going to want to um, maybe hide or unhide or otherwise change the HTML content based on um, what our script evaluates. So first first easy example here. All right, let's, let's do something more, more meaningful. I don't know about meaningful, more interesting. Um, we can use the query selector method in another way too. The query selector method can also be used to select an element by its class. This is super useful. For example, we assigned the class a value to the class attribute for this button is demo and on a web page we might have several buttons we might have hundreds of buttons and we might want to distinguish one button for the other by using different values for the class attribute so rather than using the query selector method to look for buttons we can use the query selector method to look for elements whose class is demo for example and that can make it more easy to find a reference to the element we're looking for. So let's actually do that. Let's create a variable called button. And on our document, we'll call query selector. But now we'll specify the class as well. And we do this the same way we do this in CSS. I can specify the, the, the tag like button and then do a dot and then do the class name, which is demo. So now button is going to refer to a button whose class is demo. And that helps us quickly find what it is we're looking for. Usually when the JavaScript code is uh, loaded and executed as part of the page loading, um, we, we, uh, we find a bunch of elements, we assign them to variables. We don't usually change the web page immediately we usually do it in response to different events. Um, so thinking back to APCSA, when we learned about event listeners for the GUIs we did, like button click listeners and stuff like that, action event listeners, um, 
JavaScript has an extremely similar model. It's the same design pattern. And that's what we're going to use um, to basically associate a listener with a button being clicked. Um, and so here's how we do that. So we're going to use the add event listener method, add event listener method. It attaches an event handler. Um, what I mean by event handler is just a function. It attaches a function to the specified element associated with the specified event. There are many different events. Um, the event we're going to be focused on is the click event. The user has clicked on an element on the web page. So we do this by using button. Button refers to the button we found of the certain class. And then we do an add event listener. We specify the name of the event as a string, click. And then we specify a function. This could be the name of a JavaScript function, like if we declared one up above, that would be fine. Usually, however, we use arrow functions for this. So we're going to write another one of these arrow functions. So it's been a few days. So for an arrow function, we in this case, we have an open and close parenthesis because there are no parameters to this function. We then have the arrow operator. And then I'm going to put in curly brackets, I'm going to put for now, I'm just going to put in alert. Alert is a... Um, JavaScript method that we can invoke um, when our code is running in a web browser and it will pop up a little dialogue. And I don't know, we're going to say, ouch, ouch, stop poking me. Let's try this. So I'm gonna, actually I already have it loaded. I'm just gonna refresh this page, scroll down to the button, and if I click on it, an alert pops up. Ouch, stop poking me. I can do it again. All right, so now we're starting to make our web page dynamic by responding to user events in the web page with JavaScript. Super cool. There are many different types of events. We're just gonna deal with click for now. Question. I'm pretty sure the syntax used for query selector is the same syntax that's used for job or for CSS. So notice here how the CSS selected by um, tag followed by class. I think query selector does the exact same thing. I think when it's an ID, we use a hash symbol. I believe I am a little rusty and have to usually look this stuff up. Um, so I think the selectors are the same. Oh, like from a CSS perspective somehow? Oh, probably so. Yeah. So again, like there are so many different ways to do the things we're doing for better or worse. So I'm just kind of showing one, right? Like I like this way of doing event listeners because it keeps all of our code in the JavaScript file. There's other ways of specifying the JavaScript um, event handler in the HTML as opposed to in the JavaScript file. I think by separating those in different files, it just makes it more complicated. So that's why I'm going with, with this method. Let's do one more thing. Um, one more example. So client side JavaScript code can modify the attributes of HTML elements. Um, so let me show you what that means. Let's create a variable called my image and we'll do document.querySelector again. And we're gonna grab the first image in the document of which there's only one. The image in our document is the 
um, Mozilla icon here, the Firefox icon here. So we'll, we'll grab a reference to that element. And then we're going to say my image dot add event listener. So we can add an event listener to things other than buttons. We're adding an event listener now to an image. Um, and we're going to listen for the click event because you can click on an image. And we're going to specify another arrow function that will have a little bit more code in it. It's going to be more than just an alert. Um, we're going to do a few things. We're going to get the source of that image by invoking the get attribute, oops, not animations, the get attribute method on the image. And we're going to say we want a reference to the source attribute. The source attribute right now is images slash Firefox icon dot PNG. We could have also gotten a reference to the alt text, right? So we can we can get the value of any of the attributes associated with this image element. We're going to focus on the source. And then we're going to write some conditional code. This is what makes our web page dynamic. We're going to say, if my source is equal to, I'm using the triple equal sign here because I want to compare the strings, not the references. So if the source equals images slash Firefox icon, PNG, then we're going to change the image. So I'm going to say my image dot set attribute. I'm going to set the source attribute to be a different graphics file. Inside of our images folder, here's the Firefox icon, but we also have this GitHub image for our class. So I'm going to change this to se dash GitHub dash image dot PNG. else. I'm going to copy this. We're going to make it toggle. So if it's the Firefox image, we'll make it the GitHub image. And if it's the GitHub image, we'll put it back to be the Firefox image. So here's an example of showing you a slightly more sophisticated event handler that checks the state of something. In this case, which image is currently displayed and then reacts to that state, um, in this case, by changing the image. So if I switch back to the page and reload this, now if I click on the Firefox icon, it switches to the GitHub icon and back and forth. Okay, so we're starting to have a more dynamic web page by having JavaScript running in the client. Can we add what? So, Tell me more about what you mean by that. Oh, probably. I don't know. We have to try. I don't see why not. My, my understanding is you can rebuild your entire document object model um, through JavaScript if you want. So you can pretty much do whatever you want. It might be a pain, but you can do whatever you want. Sure. Might not be a good idea, but yes. <laughs> We're going to be using Node.js. Um, so we... We won't be using either of those. There are many web frameworks out there. Um, we're going to focus on just Node.js, which is like what this unit is preparing us for. Um, no. Well, Express is part of Node.js. So yes. Yeah, yeah. We'll use a lot of Node.js packages to, to make our lives easier for sure. We're not like writing it from scratch. So we will certainly use Express. Um, We'll certainly use um, EJS to dynamically generate our web pages. So we're not writing our own JavaScript to like change elements. We're gonna use a lot of tools that make our life easier. But we're not gonna use like React or Angular or Vue or any of those things. So. 
let me show you one more thing. Um, Cause I don't want to forget this. Uh, let's set a breakpoint. There are a couple different ways to debug this. Um, one is I can set a breakpoint here. And I can refresh this page. Yeah, that did not work. All right, I will come back to how to set a breakpoint in VS Code. There is certainly a way to do it. But I'll also show you the other way to do it, um, which is super useful. So we've only got a couple minutes left. Let me grab this. And I know certain features weren't working in Chrome. Sorry about that. I thought I tested Chrome, but maybe I only tested Firefox. Um, but I'm going to do it in Chrome just for a demonstration here. Um, Firefox is very similar. I need to download Firefox. But we, we were looking at the inspect element stuff. Um, there's all sorts of other developer tools as well. And so here's like the inspect element stuff that you were playing with on, on Friday. You can also look at the source code to your HTML files, your CSS files, and your scripts. Um, so I can actually set a breakpoint in my JavaScript file inside of the web browser. And then if I refresh this, I'm now debugging the JavaScript code running in Chrome. And so I can do all the same stuff like continue, step over, step in, step out, run to break, all the same features we're used to, I can do here. I can see my call stack. Um, I can look at different variables. Um, I can see all sorts of things. So notice it still says Mozilla is cool, but as I step through this, I'm about now to change my heading and I can actually see information, all the information about that element that my heading variable is referencing. If I step over this line of code, we'll see it change to hello world, okay? So I think a lot of times we think because we're writing JavaScript in a web client, we have to do console.log for everything as if we were like back in programming one and learning how to write Python. You don't have to do that. Don't make your life miserable, okay? Use the debugger built into the web browser to set breakpoints, to inspect your variables, and to be more efficient with your debugging. There is definitely a way to also do this within VS Code. Um, and I just have to check my notes because there's some setting I'm missing. <laughs>